Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find links to all the blogs and the Twitters and the entire back catalog. It's also an RSS feed, and you can find us in the iTunes library. Once again, I have Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. Sure. Good to be here. Hey, um, you remember that time when that guy wrote that blog article about that thing that kind of blew up the whole HPC community and whatnot? He was saying that MPI is killing HPC and all that stuff. Do you remember that? You're talking about our friend to the north, and uh, some of us wrote some replies to that and had different takes on what was going on. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, Jonathan Dursey. So uh, what, what do you know about Jonathan? Well, he seemed to actually raise a bunch of interesting points. I, I can't say I agreed with everything that he wrote, but he did raise a bunch of good points. I'm, I'm kind of thinking that we should have a special edition of RCE and actually talk to this guy. Different than our normal, you know, talk to an HPC project and stuff like that. Let's talk to someone who's actually using all this HPC stuff, and let's go in, in, in depth about that blog article. What do you think of that? Hi there, Brock. Hi, Jeff. It's Jonathan Dursey. Oh, what a coincidence. We were just talking about you. All right, all the cans set up aside. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. I wonder if you could give us a quick brown and uh, quick background on yourself and introduce yourself to our listeners. Sure, thanks. I'd, I'd be happy to. So my name's Jonathan Dursey. I uh, blog now a little bit at dursey.ca. Uh, and, you know, like a lot of us, I think, in this field, I started off in HPC as a user. I was an Astro grad student at the University of Chicago's ASCII Flash Center back in the day, um, where I had to use and, and develop large HPC simulations. And like a lot of us, I got you know, more and more interested in the computing. I did a postdoc here in Astro at the University of Toronto, and it ended up joining a new HPC center here, Synet. And, and so there I had the opportunity to work with a lot of different users doing a lot of different things. I, I also helped out sort of coordinate talking to people at other HPC centers. And most recently, I, um, I'm lucky enough to be working at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, where I'm working on cancer genomics, computing, and algorithms, and I'm really getting exposed to a lot of different things there. Cool. All right. So it's in the context of all of this stuff that you wrote your most ser- your most recent series of, of two or three blog entries or so. And wish we could have done this a little bit earlier, but it took us a week or two to get us all so that we could schedule together for this uh, recording or so. But um, I, I don't want to say the you know just read off the URL to your blog because it's too long to listen to. But it's definitely in the the show notes. And the short version of it is Dursi.ca, D-U-R-S-I.ca. Go to the blog links under there. Uh, and so if you're listening, you'll be able to, to find the, the specific content that we're talking about on here. But, Jonathan, I wonder if you could just give us, give us a, a summary of what your message is and what are you trying to say? Yeah, so, so this is the most exciting time to be doing big technical computing that I can remember. And I've been doing this for, for a little while. So there's more... You know, big numerical computing tools available to us and our users that we can choose from, shape, and prove you know, than ever before. And, and you know, there's this moment where we in the community can decide what we want HPC programming to be like for the next five or ten years. Um, there doesn't have to be so much repetitive boilerplate that we're asking researchers to do. We and the researchers can really get to the good parts. We can and if, if we choose this right, we can choose to be relevant and helpful not only to our traditional HPC users, but to this growing group of, of biology, of big data users that are out there doing really interesting research. And so when I wrote this post, um, HPC is dying and MPI is killing it, I was really concerned that we as a community were sort of sleepwalking into this really exciting and rapidly changing time, sort of stuck on default, uh, doing things the way we've, we've always been doing them for the, for the past two decades. So I can't help but agree with that more, but I, I can't help but feel like, if you remember my reply about that exact topic, and I'm excited about these tools too, and I've been working with a lot of non-traditional users who have structured data and are kind of moving from spreadsheets to DBMS systems to using things like Spark, is in my notes I had legacy and user education, 
Right. But it's almost not legacy. It's almost like latency. How do we push forward faculty and students being aware of this stuff? Because if you ask them, they don't even know these things exist. You know, I, I think I think that's exactly right, and um, and it's 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 a tough problem because even we're just learning about some of these things, right? I think it is true that that we, you know, people who work at say HPC centers, researchers and especially grad students and postdocs do to some extent look to us for guidance on what technologies to choose. They they're the ones taking our classes and showing up in our offices with questions. So I think we collectively play a pretty big role in deciding what gets used by nudging researchers in various directions. Of course, you can't, you know, you can't force a faculty member to do much of anything. Um, you know, there are people who are using their own tools and that's what they're happy with. And that's great. But, you know, people who aren't sure what they want to use, we have a responsibility to guide them towards tools that will work best for their research and uh, and that's not always necessarily the stuff that that we have the most experience in. So so nudging things forward, you know, will or changing directions will take some time. And that's that's why I was really uh, insistent that we start thinking about this now. And this will require us staff to be learning new things and interacting with the broader community. You know, learning how people solve different problems, but. You know, that that's why I took these jobs. That, that's what really excites me. And I just I just want to say I, I really think this podcast actually does a lot of really good work exposing us, the people who are going to work with the researchers, uh, to a whole bunch of tools that are out there that a lot of us wouldn't hear of otherwise. Flattery will get you everywhere on this show. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so I like just to add on to that i mean something that i found is that a lot of students so i i work in a university not a research lab and i wonder if the experience is different you can tweet us whether or not you think that's it's a different experience at research labs but among graduate students they pretty much do what other people in their lab are doing which pretty much always trickles back to what their faculty told them to use and we're finding that they are a lot of times the least educated in terms of what new things are are out there. And so when you ask someone, it's like, why are you using Fortran 77? It's like, well, because isn't, isn't that all there is? And they just don't know there's anything else. I think a very illustrative example is, is a lot of the math libraries that have been out there for a long time. Blast and LePak have been around for um, a couple of decades now. And many times I'm still educating users that like, hey, I know it's only a triple four loop, but you really shouldn't write that yourself. So getting getting more education out there, I think, is really important. It really is. And it's it's tough because doing that well, this, this is sort of a bigger policy question, but to, to really make, to really help researchers make use of even the tools that already exist and, and are venerable, like, like Layback, like, like you point out, that takes a lot of you know, boots on the ground, a lot of people working with researchers so they can take advantage of even what already exists. Um, if we want researchers to be able to take advantage of new things, you know, all the more so, because they're just not going to be able to pick up a book on I'm going to use Spark as an example. I, I don't even think Spark necessarily is is ready for HPC use. But uh, you know, there's no book Spark for HPCers that that a diligent grad student is going to be able to pick up and learn on their own. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I have to color my remarks with I haven't worked directly with users since I left academia nine ish years or so ago. Um, I work with some customers and whatnot, but it's not quite the same as just walking down the lab because there's some faculty member or, or grad student and whatnot. So temper, temper all my stuff, uh, all my answers here with this. But I, I generally want to agree with you, and it's, it's such a huge problem that there's, there's multiple dimensions to it. There's not just getting the education out there, but getting people to pay attention mm -hmm. to the education, right? The, the pressure back when I was in academia, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's still the same, is the whole publisher parish, and they are looking for the fastest way to get their results with the minimal amount of education of the junk 
from their perspective to get their research done. They really want to focus on the science of what they're doing and, and certainly can't fault that at all. I mean, that is what they're doing. And so the minimal way to get there is to copy what your buddy is doing, take code that your advisor has already written or you know, whatever piecemeal knowledge you can scrape together so that you can focus on the science that you're doing um, is the way that I saw a lot of people going to it. So we would have um, seminars and classes all the time about uh, either using MPI directly or using some higher level tools. Um, and they would be sparsely populated. And the reason why, you know, inevitably was, oh, I, I didn't have time. I really wanted to go to that. It looked interesting, but I just didn't have time because I got this paper due or well, we got a conference coming up or something like that. And it's, it's the trade off of you know the the short term immediate goals versus the long term learning uh which will provide more benefits but it's really hard to see that and sometimes even hard to justify that to to funding agencies do you guys see the same thing is this still true well so, so we we certainly see it um uh, in canadian centers the there's there's a bit more well, I mean, I think we have similar programs to say exceed or are at least familiar and, and it is tough. And, and, you know, I'd never suggest that if people have a working code and they just need to tweak it, that they rewrite it into something new, that, that would be madness. Uh, yeah, but, but it's, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It, it's uh -huh. not even that, right? They take what was working and right. then everything looks like a nail after that, right? Cause they've got a hammer and they're like, oh, well, like Brock said earlier, this is the way that it's done. So therefore, I need to make all of my work fit into whatever that model was that I was given kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is a window, too, where um, we held – well, so I was at Synet. Synet held a number of workshops on sort of big learning and machine uh, – big data machine learning uh, tools, and those were absolutely packed to the rafters because I think you know grad students do have a, a pretty good sense that that's something that you know that's something that's very employable right now. So okay. I, I think I think there is some interest, maybe maybe not necessarily even for for the reasons that that we'd hope for that there there is some interest in new things, and but but ultimately I think people will pick up on what works. And right now, the stuff that they have around the lab that works is often fairly old. Uh, but once people in their labs do start having some successes with different approaches, then that does gather some interest. But, you, but it takes a lot of time and effort to, to make those first inroads. And that's, that's a much harder problem than a, than a technical problem. Yeah, I mean, the approach I've mostly used, given this is this is my job, is pretty much shock and awe. Like, you know, go in, something that doesn't work at all, and I use Hive or Spark or something like that and to just show how quickly I can work with, say, survey data, just massive quantities of survey data for the social scientist or something like that, is, is really where I finally started to get people's attention, something that didn't work at all. And not only can I now do it, I can do it in you know, very reasonable time periods. And, and that's pretty much the only success. Things had to get so bad that they didn't even work that faculty even started asking around for how could I do something. And th that's kind of rough. And I think actually there's probably more appetite for that in the, the sort of new and emerging disciplines using big computing than in the in the uh more traditional fields i know certainly when i was an astro grad student i i probably would not have been super interested in innovative new approaches we had something that kind of worked um and and you know by god that's what we were gonna keep doing I, I almost wonder if part of the reason a lot of these tools came up was because they were developed almost in completely different communities. And, and I really hope that our community does not get buried down in the not built here sort of idea. But it seems like there's a bit of a split. It seems like the, 
Spark and Hadoop is really, and the big data stuff is really being driven by the commercial space and not by the academic space. And that it's a completely different set of users working with completely different sets of data and completely different disciplines than we've traditionally worked in. And we really should kind of take one of those big tent approaches because I'm already starting to see things like Spark implementing linear algebra. Right. And people doing traditional compute implementing large graphing, large graph partitioning systems. And why... And each of them are strong, each one of those things. So we should be kind of merging to some degree. Well, I think I think we in the HPC centers um, or you know, computational science centers, I think you know, we're used to seeing that in, in other areas, right? We How often have, um, have we connected some user doing chemistry research with someone who actually has a very similar problem, but they're in something crazy like forestry or something, um, or, you know, we copy these methods or even, even, rec- even faculty members on the same floor on the same hall who don't realize that, you know, their neighbor is doing similar problems. So I think we're, we're pretty good at bridging these sort of silos that build up within our institutions. And I think, you know, we can, we can do some of that, across to the, the uh, big data sort of communities too, sort of unilaterally. Um, it's certainly, you know, we don't need to wait for an engraved invitation to start filing issues or, or pull requests for new features or, um, or, or, you know, something that they love hearing is of course, you know, success stories of researcher used their thing for something completely unexpected. You know, it's well, well, one thing I want c- us to, to not get sidetracked on because right. part of your uh, articles got a little criticized for saying, well, big data, that's totally different than HPC. And regardless of whether people agree or disagree with that statement, I don't think that was the, the point for you bringing up big data. You had this interesting graph about the growth of big data compared to the growth of MPI and HPC. And I think that was more your point of saying, here's a at least sort of similar um, set of technologies and, and, and problem space and why is their community growing way faster than ours? Is that where you were going with that? Not so much saying we should do big data and, right. and all the things that big data are doing should be done in HPC. Yeah. So I, I think that's absolutely true. The, you know, for, for decades, the HPC community was sort of the repository of, of expertise on, on big numerical computing um, and, you know, we, at, at some point, other big computing groups started growing up around cloud computing and sort of internet scale computing. And, you know, that was, that was sort of a different set of problems in a way. So we sort of sat that out. Um, original tools like Hadoop MapReduce weren't necessarily super useful to our users. And so, you know, fine, that's a, that's a different thing. But now it turns out all those people collecting big data actually want want to analyze it. And they start doing things, like you mentioned, Brock, like wanting to solve big numerical linear algebra uh, problems or, or solving PDEs on something that looks an awful lot like an unstructured mesh. And there's all this growth going on in that area on problems that would be very similar to us, uh, very familiar to us, but we've we're, we've sort of sat ourselves out on the sidelines and we're not participating in this, and I think that's that's a shame for a couple reasons. One, we we have expertise that can be applied to these problems, um, but people will go off and solve these problems independently on their own if if we choose not to jump in there. And also, these new tools are being built up that eventually some of our users are going to look over there and say, actually, you know, that would be fairly good for my problem now. Performance has gotten good enough. I think I'm going to try using the next generation of Spark or Flink or Moop or Plop or whatever the next thing is. And if the big data community uh, is the only community actively providing those tools, then, then that's where our users would go. And and they should if that's what's solving their problem. So, so that's that's what really motivated that that post. This concern that we're intentionally sitting out of a bunch of really 
interesting problems that we have expertise that can be applied to. I must say that the response um, to that blog post actually makes me slightly less concerned because I, I do see, you know, I did get a lot of responses that agree that there, there's a problem and, and we should participate somehow. There's no, I, I'm still a little concerned because there's not a lot of consensus of, of what we should do next, but a lot more, uh, many more people are, are looking at this than I had realized at the time. Well, I just want to take one side note out of out of your answer there that I need to go register all those domain names like Floop and, and Flinky and whatnot to make sure that I get in on the next cold rush. Yes, there's definitely a monopoly on good names in the big data community. <laughs> so if we, if we move along and we think about our traditional users, our traditional scientific users, um, the people who have always had the really computational intensive rather than data intensive work. What what have we learned from looking at some of the things that we see from the internet scale and the big data community that we should probably be implementing? Like what should kind of come after MPI? So that's a great question, and I think uh, I think this is a a question that that we all have really. That, that we all have uh, different perspectives on in this call. I'd be very interested to hear what your answers are. I think the one big thing we've learned um, by looking around, and it's not just the big data community, even seeing efforts inside our community like Chapel, is that um, there is an awful big advantage to having, to having our scientists or researchers or application developers building on layers that have a lot of that have stuff done for them that that we can architect um, that we can architect tools and platforms that have a lot of batteries included so i'm you know we've mentioned linear algebra it just does not make sense to have uh, users writing linear algebra routines that they end up spending a lot of effort for you know a worse result by any measure. Uh, same thing with MPI collectives. I'm sure, Brock, you've had this. There are users walked in, and it turns out they're looping over sends or something. There, there is there's stuff that it just does not make sense for a researcher to reimplement. Um, this this sort of boilerplate has has been done. These these primitives have been built, and and they can be um, they can be used more effectively. Uh, than the users writing their own, so I think that I think that's the biggest thing that that this idea that um, having researchers code at the lowest possible level is is good for performance um, isn't isn't true anymore. There's been there's been tons of work on 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 building up layers that can be used uh, more productively by researchers. Um, when it comes right down to it, halo exchange or tree updates aren't that different from linear algebra. People have written them. Um, they're really, really performant. And it would be awesome if we could provide more tools so that researchers can can call those things instead of writing their own. Yeah, I I struggle with that myself because uh, conceptually you're absolutely right. We, we want to give somebody the perfect tool so that they can call one line of code and then do the thing that they want to do, you know, do their science or whatever problem it is that they're they're trying to solve. But the, conceptually, the problem, at least on the implementation side, the the perception is well. Let's see, I don't want to generalize this. I'll say my perception and my experience has been that as soon as we build a tool, um, it it makes one user happy or or a very small number of users happy. And then the next set of users come along and say, oh, yes, I, I'm doing something similar to that, but it's a little different, right? And so the, the, the big characterization of HPC codes is that there is no silver bullet. And I don't know if that's an accurate representation or not, but there is no – you know, one universal solution that fixes everything. And that's why there are so many homegrown HPC applications. Yes, there are some very 
popular and powerful ISV applications out there that a lot of people use with a lot of success, and they just happen to use MPI or some form of parallelization underneath the covers. But for all of those, there's still a bazillion of homegrown applications that people are doing and writing to solve their own unique problems. How, how do we address that? Right? How do we address the one of the actual strengths of our field is that there is so much diversity. But by everything that we've been talking about, it's also a, a getting to be a major curse. Jeff, I'm, so, I'm going to inject here and somewhat disagree with you. So, you know, you and I, we were talking to a developer not that long ago about, you know, why are a lot of these big data things written in Java? And it's like, well, they're companies. They tend to not, they don't care about that last bit of performance because an algorithm or a, an implementation is only going to live for, you know, a year or two and then be replaced by something. And I, I see that fitting what happens in the academic space a lot too, at least for the average grad student. They have four years to get something done, they graduate, and then that code pretty much dies from there. A very small fraction of them, I would think, actually survive for a long time. A lot of the long-lived codes we've already had on the show. Uh, there's not a whole lot. And in terms of success of making a tool like that, look at the success of MATLAB. Look at the success of R. Um, and then look at the not so much success of things like Julia. I, I don't know what makes it work, but there's definitely examples of higher level environments that people really gravitate to because they find it easier to get some work done. So I think this, this is a really important discussion to have too, that both of you have brought up that the, the median MPI code is not some, you know, well, uh, some hugely well-financed um, big community code that has had tons of optimization focus on that sort of the median scientific programming project is, is something that's, that's put together for a few papers. And sometimes one of those tools will be so successful that it grows into something bigger, but, but to do that growing, it ends up having to be, you know, substantially rewritten anyway. So I, I think I think we in the HPC world tend to focus on the codes we see most often, which are, you know, you know, Gromax, uh, Lamps, you know, any of a number of things that that have had a lot, a lot of, lot of developer focus on it. But you know the median scientific developer is, is probably just trying to get something done f so they can get four papers out. And it would be nice if we had tools, yeah, and maybe they have to be different tools, but tools that addressed both of those sets of needs. Uh, and it's tough because we have been, in our community, we've been horribly burnt by um, tools that promised much more than than they actually could deliver uh yeah it's, it we're lucky now i guess that people have stopped trying to sell us automatic parallelizing compilers uh but there were an awful lot of you know this will fix everything you know projects proposed and and they didn't fix everything is is the answer more focused tools uh, domain specific languages is the answer um, higher level tools where you can delve down into the into the the guts if you need to to change something you know maybe that would work and I, I think there's a lot there's a lot to be said for that approach i mean sometimes uh, sometimes a tool builder say does need to go into um, the lower levels we've all had situations where we've had to rewrite a loop to tile it for cache performance or you know, explicitly vectorize it for something, but we don't we don't start writing code like that, or else we'd never get anything done. We we use high level stuff, and then we delve into the low level only if there's evidence that we need to. Uh, but it's tough. There's there's not even one uh, best serial programming language for scientific computing. Maybe maybe there. Maybe there isn't one best thing for uh, parallel scientific computing. Yeah, you raised a lot of good points here, too, that um, 
I, I guess I kind of see those as, as the extremes, right? So we've got these upper level general languages that are easy, but not necessarily the best performing, right? Because they're, they're designed for general purpose. And uh, by definition, you're trying to do something very specific. But then there's the domain specific ones as well that are super focused and super optimized for one particular set of of applications or problems or, or whatever it is that they're trying to solve. But then trying to distill the wheat from the chaff of all of these choices becomes a super daunting problem, right? At, at supercomputing, every year we see a, a whole range of both uh, products and research projects that, just like you said, claim to solve all the world's problems. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm at least somewhat guilty of that as well uh, because everybody's looking from their particular foxhole for their particular problem saying, this is going to do it. This is going to solve everything. This is going to make users' lives better and birds are going to sing and children are going to be laughing and, and all these kinds of things. And some of them, that is true. Most of them, it's not. You're, you're you know, trying to publish a paper or, or sell some product or, or whatever it is you're trying to do. So trying to distill you know, what are the ones that I should pay attention to gets into the problems that we were talking back in the beginning uh, here about the education, like what actually works, what's going to help this particular user get their problem done. And so is that part of the problem that there's really so much new um, that it's hard to know and so people gravitate towards a lowest common denominator. For example, in this case, oh, I'm going to write to MPI because I can't figure out some of these newfangled tools or know which one's any good for me to use. What do you, what do you guys think of that as a supposition? I, th I think there's some truth to that. I, I do want to say that's a, as far as problems go, that's a pretty high-class problem to have, that there is so much cool stuff out there that, that it's not necessarily obvious what to do. Um, there are, you know, there are already things that we can point users to in, in pretty clear conscience, right? Um, someone who's writing, say, Fortran or you know, MATLAB or something, you know, we can pretty be pretty confident in pointing them to things like Coarray Fortran. That is, that is hard coded in the Fortran standard now. It will outlive all of us. Um, and and for for smaller projects. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that I think are, are still um, pretty tractable. One thing would just be not asking them to write raw MPI and using libraries that extremely well tested, like Trillinos or, or the like. Um, there, there are lots of things we can start pointing them to that, that is, you know, somewhere between, you know, that, that isn't all the way to, you know, crazy town, uh, Hadoop type things, um, unless that's actually what they need for their problem. So <laughs> there's the quote of the podcast right there: "Crazy town Hadoop things." <laughs> All right, so let me let me uh, play right off of this because this was also one of the um, criticisms for your blog entry was like, well, no, you know, lots of people. There are some fantastic MPI based libraries out there where people don't have to know MPI, they just, you know, call some magic function, parallelization happens underneath the covers, they don't even know that it happens, and so on. And, and one of your retorts to that was, uh, really struck a resonant note with me, saying, yes, I agree with you, there's a lot of fantastic MPI libraries out there, but the leakage of MPI abstractions is way too strong, and it actually... Oh, I don't even remember you, the word you used, but it, it, it's, you know, the essence, essence was that it's harmful, that it's not, the, the users have to know more MPI than they really should. Am I characterizing your, your argument properly? So I, I think there's two things there. I think MPI, the, the sort of uh, uh, the standard, the, the, the whole model, I think MPI makes that inevitable. And I, and that I see as a, that I see as a problem. Um, but that's not, you know, that's a shame, but that doesn't mean that users shouldn't use these things. I, I think that, you know, if we, if we move to something else, um, maybe more than one other thing, I think new libraries, new frameworks would have less of that maybe. Uh, 
But having said that, you know, any of these extreme, you know, uh, you know extremely well-built, well-tested libraries um, is, is a huge productivity win for our researchers over having them reinvent that particular wheel. Yeah, so I think I, I, I actually agree with most of your points there that um, – yeah, I, I don't need to restate all of them. I, I agree with most of them there. But I also agree with there are lots of quality MPI libraries out there that do take a lot of the burden off. But mm-hmm. here's my question that, you know, as a member of the MPI forum, trying to shape the next generation of MPI, um, trying to actually stir up exactly this discussion in the MPI forum itself, what should we do? Like if, if we had a blue sky today, and we could make, you know, MPI next generation, MPI 20, right? Um, that, you know, looked sort of like what we have today. So it's not completely unfamiliar. But what are some of the mistakes and what are the things that guarantee leakage out of these otherwise wonderful libraries of MPI abstractions? What would you like to see fixed? Well, so... So, you know, MPI has been enormously successful over the last two decades, and it, it has this huge installed base that it has a lot of responsibility to. And so that's, that's part of the natural life cycle of a software project. So I kind of view MPI as being what it is. It, I'd be surprised if it made big changes at that, this point. And in fact, I think it would be unreasonable of us to ask it to. Um, but yeah so but you know maybe not using the word mpi maybe just you know what what do we want hpc programming to look like what what you know what would be the ideal stack if if we were starting from scratch i'm not sure that we know yet but i do think that there's a lot of really interesting projects that we can you know begin supporting and see how how they grow and succeed and and you know start pushing in one direction or another i I think it would probably be a huge mistake to to start a uh, a new standards body at this point while things are just congealing but there's a lot of things we can learn from so i you know chapel is something that I mentioned chapel I think is really interesting because it it separates the data decomposition from the operations on the data and you know one is one is implemented in the domains and one is implemented in the application code and you can write your own domains if you want i think that's really interesting um and that that stops some of that leakage or at least means that if you do realize that that um things aren't decomposed the way you you'd want it, it at least offers the hope that you can change the decomposition without blowing up all your application code. I think this idea of, um, say, Spark having a very particular um, abstraction, a resilient distributed data set, basically a big uh, data table, and having a bunch of operations on that, I think that works really well for a lot of applications. And you see things that aren't necessarily obvious built on top of that, like graph libraries. So I, I think this idea of you know, multiple levels at which you can interact with the tools, I think that's really powerful, and it'll take us a little while to decide what is going to be the best for most of our users, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to hold off from playing with some of these things. There's a you know, small, short term scientific software projects of which there's tons out there are wonderful opportunities to adopt some of these new technologies, try them. Um, in many of these tools, you can put something together that works very quickly and, and judge its success. And, and many of these short term projects, they don't necessarily have to have, you know, blazing fast performance, but, but getting something coded quickly and working um, can be a huge win more than you know more than uh, you know hitting eighty percent optimization you know eighty percent utilization on the CPU. 
So something though about your point about MPI leaking through, for myself, that's actually kind of been a feature because what that's always been is the underlying structure kind of leaks through. An example I had recently was with Spark. And I had a person who wanted to invert a 800 gigabyte matrix. That's, that's all they wanted to do was just invert it. And if you Google for Spark invert, you'll find something, but it turns out it's just for a local CPU. At mm. that point, because the communication that Spark uses is not exposed to the end user, I pretty much was like stuck. I, I was to a point where it was the equivalent of having to modify MPI almost. Like I'd have to dig inside the core library. And it felt very dirty, and I felt very much at the mercy of the programmer. Now, I'm very new to Spark. I may be completely wrong on all this stuff. But it, it feels like if you don't have some of that exposed, you're then, if you can't make do with the constraint that was put around you, th this is the ease of use flexibility trade-off, mm -hmm. that you're kind of at the mercy of the developer then you have to almost wait for them to put something in place or you have to become a very very sophisticated developer yourself and i i i could see arguments that that wouldn't be that great now the nice thing about spark and some of these other things is they run on top of a generic infrastructure and yarn containers and you don't have to you can run spark along a beside a bunch of other things and hopefully in the end we can run Spark and MapReduce and HDFS and POSIX and MPI and all, Serial all along each other in the same flexible environment because that will actually serve our users the best being able to support whatever it is that they are comfortable using. Telling a user but that Brock, they have to use something is not necessarily the best thing. Yeah, I don't know if that was the, the full point though because being able to dive into the guts of something when you want to or when you need to is certainly a wonderful thing, right? One way to do that is just, you know, hey, open source, just go look at the code yourself. That's not a great answer from an abstraction point of view, but it is a answer that gets used. And it's it certainly would be better if the abstraction itself just supported it saying, oh, you could completely ignore MPI and do your thing. Or if you want to dive a little deeper, we provide some hooks to give you, you know, access to the MPI underneath or whatever. But I think the point is being forced to adhere to the underlying abstractions that you shouldn't otherwise have to care about. That's what you want to potentially avoid, right? For the, for the total newbie user, they don't want to have to know anything about MPI. They just want to call one line of code, and it does some magic for them, and they have their answer. That's kind of the, the gold standard. You know, can, I don't know if we can ever get there for every single problem in the world, but that's what you want. And then for the more advanced user, when they say, ah, okay, that one line of code is not doing exactly what I want. I want to tweak it. I want to do a little things. You have some hooks to go deeper. And that's where I think some of these more modern architectures are going. That, you know, and not necessarily just in HPC world, but other types of, of applications, you know, mobile based applications, web based applications. You look at some of the frameworks that are out there for PHP and, and Python and Perl and things like that. And they are multi layer beasts where you can get hooks inside when you need them or otherwise you use the top level services and, and take what they give you. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I think that I, I agree with both of you. The a a too rigid um, high level abstraction, or not even too rigid, too uh, opaque, is is no better um, for users on, on average than than one that's that's super low level. It's just the problem. The problems are different, and uh, you know, it, I, ideally though you would. Ideally, though, you would minimize the number of times you have to dig, you know, deep into the lower layers to change something. So, you know, Spark, for better or worse, is growing distributed linear algebra, and it will have that, and at some point, and you know, then it will be a fixed problem for everyone. So, you know, I'd, ideally, that would uh, that would be the way things go. Of course, that doesn't help your particular user now um, sparks still a very new uh I, I won't say immature but it's it doesn't have the features that we and our users necessarily want 
and uh, and that can be frustrating. And that's something that people have to seriously think about when they're considering these things for a new project. Does this have the library support that I know I can get elsewhere? So I wonder if maybe what the most useful thing is, is to rally the community around maybe something like Chapel and also pair with a comprehensive library of libraries. Think of like CPAN or CRAN for Perl and R respectively. Um, those communities have built up a standard practice of if you need to do something, search for it, and then when you need it, you run, you know, package dot install and your MPI library already being set up or whatever the however low of an abstraction you want to go, things can come out. And I, I think the funding agencies would be interested in this because it, it should reduce deployment time. Uh and by deployment time I mean like grad student productivity to like real science rather than starting with int main or begin program. But also, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, code reuse and not recreating the wheel over and over. Well, how about you create a wheel and you publish it in a standard place where it's easy to get at and make an entire ecosystem for the entire community? So I just got this off the top of my head, so I c- could be completely smoking something. If, if we can build or choose a set of tools that support that, that that's flexible enough that it can you know, load in different modules. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned too, um, uh, CBAN and, and CRAN that, you know, have enormously benefited those two communities. And I think are, you know, without question, a big part of why those two platforms succeed because there's, there's this community standard that if, if you build something useful, you really should contribute it. And, the, the tools make it incredibly easy to do so, so much so that actually discovery becomes a little bit of a, of a problem, which, again, is a pretty high-class problem to have. Okay, so this has all been really good and all, but I, I kind of want to end on one thing in that MPI has been tremendously successful. It did bring about and kind of create a standard way of creating parallel applications when it used to be every vendor system was different. And that is almost like the first step in what we've been talking about here. And it's really the case that we need to kind of push forward and continue trying to make all this stuff better. So let's let's not discount the success MPI has had in taking us that first step. Oh, I I think you're completely right. The it was a it was a huge it was a huge win. It was vastly better than anything else that was available at the time. And it's taken us 20 years. And I think now we have the opportunity to decide for ourselves as a community, what do we want the next 20 years to look like? Yeah, I, good. Yeah, this is a great point. Let's end on being positive because there is still a lot to be thankful for and be happy about that our community has been able to achieve. But I think the point is valid and the point is very important that we do need to keep looking for the future and not – get stuck in the status of quo of it's good enough, right? So it, it's always been a challenge for us on the MPI forum to find out exactly what the users want. We get uh, an amazing lack of reply when we ask, say, hey, what do users want? And it's a real challenge, and that's part that might be part of the disconnect. We need to know because the, the members of the MPI forum are not just focused on MPI. All of us uh, touch many different things in the HPC community and and work in many next generation types of projects. So, you know, maybe MPI will continue to be a substrate or maybe just the technologies that implement MPI will continue to be the substrate. You know, what is the next set of things that we need to be working on? What are the features that uh, users need to be able to have in their applications and be more productive and things like that. These are the types of things that we, as implementers of tools, libraries, MPI implementations, and in the MPI forum itself, we really want to hear from end users and people who have boots on the ground trying to get stuff to run day after day. Yeah, I agree. I'll just I'll just add, and not just users, but the tool builders, the library builders. Um, what do they need to support those same researchers? Jonathan, thank you very much for your time. 
it was great being here after having listened for for so long thanks both of you (laughs) Well, you are very kind, sir. We appreciate your time, and I really appreciate you writing all these series of blog articles. I think this is a a fantastic uh, conversation. I I feel like we could keep talking for another hour uh, at least, um, but we do need to wrap it up because people only have so much time to listen to a podcast. But thank you very much for your time, sir. And you guys. This is Jonathan Dursey. You can find him at dursey.ca. 